I was cleaning up my eyebrows with a razor and nicked myself right in the middle of my forehead. So if you're wondering how this morning is going, that is where I'm at. Hello. Hi, it's Kendall here. If you're new around here, welcome. If you're not new around here, what is up, home scale of biscuit? I'm Ashy, pardon. And happy Saturday. If you don't know what Saturday is, Saturday is when I do a little something on my channel called Bad Movies and a Beat, the series on my channel where I talk about bad movies while putting my makeup on. However, I simply cannot watch more crap this week. <laughs> If you didn't see last week's video, I spent an hour and 40 minutes talking about all the ways and directions I hate the idol and I need a respite. I can't watch more shit this week. I will lose my mind. So instead today we're doing good movies in a glam. We're gonna talk about one of my favorite movies so that I don't jump off a bridge and hopefully my open wound won't mind getting makeup on top of it, living dangerously. But before we get started on that, let's send it over to Ad Roll Kenny. Thank you. Hello everyone, this is Adroll Kenny and today's video is sponsored by Parade. Parade is an inclusive brand that makes sustainable and affordable bras, underwear, swimwear, bralettes, and more. Personally, as a plus size woman with a seemingly constantly fluctuating bra size, I really appreciate knowing that Parade will have something that will fit me regardless of my body's undulations as it does. They provide sizes from extra small to 5X, and Parade really takes pride in that, particularly to celebrate all of us, all of our bodies, not just the ones that look like supermodel. We all want intimates that makes us feel comfortable and sexy, but most importantly, they're cute and comfortable. I'm actually wearing one right now, this blue. Again, as someone with larger breastuses that are constantly getting bigger and smaller, it seems like. There's nothing worse than trying to find a bra that fits and you finally find one and it's like a granny bra, matronly, ugly. But on Parade, you're able to find bras with varying styles, varying patterns, varying sizes, and varying levels of support. They're soft, they're comfortable, they're cute. They use fabric that would have been wasted in the process of making other garments and they use it to make their product. Ever since the pandemic, I'm a bralette girl. Very comfortable, very lounge wear like. And I also have like a matching boy short because that's also very cute. Then I got this like sprinkles one. I thought that was very cute. I got a 2X. I think I could have gone down to a 1X. They have the adjustable straps in the back even with the bralettes. So I also got a matching thong for this, but I got to save that for my schmoly schmans. I'm joking. I don't have a schmoly schman. <laughs> that I'm wearing these that have this cute little like lacing in the back. So if you would like to check out Parade, feel free to click on the link down below. Use code Kim Kenny50 to get 50% off site wide. Big thanks again to Parade for sponsoring today's video. Now let's get on to the debauchery. So yes, like I said last time, we talked about the idol, but what did we talk about before that? Oh, Perfect Addiction. The one where um, we had all the like after YA, new adult, young adult type garbage, tropey garbage, but instead it was of color. And for that reason alone, I give it at least a 2.5 out of five. It's one of those like college romances where for some reason there's a fight club at the college, but this one's very messy and people were saying that the two twists, it got them cause it got me too. So if you wanna check out that video, that'll be linked uh, up above or you can check it out in the Bad Movies in a Beat playlist. And like I said, this week I could not watch more garbage. So we're watching Misery, babe. <laughs> I can't do it. Like I said, I was talking about the idol last week and it's just been an incessant influx of more information that I didn't want to know about the idol. I want it to be done, babe. But then I saw the clip of Sam Levinson explicitly calling the weekend's character Tedros the victim by the end. This pimp from the Midwest ends up being the victim. Groomed, abused, pimped, exploited, manipulated, so many people. Assuming you think that the shitty writing makes sense, the worst that had happened to him is that somebody lied to him and he's the victim in this situation. Go eat a dick, Sam. I'm just happy that for once, this is a situation where sheer shock value doesn't actually benefit the people who make stuff like that. So hopefully this will be a reminder that sheer shock value does not equal talent. Sam, hopefully you will find some of that as you reflect. And I was planning to watch more garbage this week, something from Tubi, but I'm in a very fragile state, as you can imagine, after The Idol. So instead, we're talking about Misery, because it's a good movie and I really like it. 1990s Misery 
is a Stephen King adaptation of the book of the same name about an author, because if it's a Stephen King novel, uh, you got a 75% chance that it is, who ends up in the care of a crazed fan after he suffers a car accident in the middle of a Colorado snowstorm. It's a very interesting pre-social media reminder that, you know, stands, parasocial relationships, fandom, fanaticism has existed long before YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, yada, yada. And beyond that, it's just a very good movie. It's the first, and if I'm not mistaken, the only Stephen King adaptation to win an Oscar with Kathy Bates, who plays Annie Wilkes. And I don't think anyone else could have played this part but Kathy Bates. She was incredible. Which, as a side note, the fact that only one Stephen King movie has won an Oscar is very interesting to me. I would have thought Shawshank or The Green Mile or one of those would have won something. I didn't know he made this. Oh, I'm gonna have to watch that later. Gerald's Game. I heard Gerald's game was very good. And Misery has been on my list of classics that I've wanted to get around to for a very long time, but I've been too busy watching garbage. <laughs> and I finally got around to watching it the tail end of last year, and it's just as good as I thought it would be. I was already aware of the core premise and how it would kind of go, just simply because I, for better or worse, a lot of my 20th century uh, pop culture knowledge comes from Family Guy. <laughs> And there's a Stephen King episode where they do a, a part of it on Misery as like a spoof where Stewie is playing Annie Wilkes. You can't go into space because the machine already got blown up by Jake Cockadoo Debussy. And I remember it being quite funny and I wanted to watch the actual movie. I'm not particularly proud that most of my pop culture knowledge from the years 1965 to 1994 four is from Family Guy, but hey, we're here, aren't we? Sometimes it's a winding road and we're not quite sure how we got here. But yeah, today we're gonna talk about it in case you haven't seen it or maybe you have seen it and it was like maybe a childhood movie that freaked you out or maybe it's a movie like me that has been on your long list of classics that you wanna get around to and this is your little nudge to do so cause it's very much so worth it. Without further ado, this is Misery. 1990. So our movie begins focused on our main male lead. This is Paul Sheldon, who is an author who is up in a cabin finishing the last chapter of his newest novel. And once he finishes a new novel, he has a sort of a ritual where he lights a singular cigarette and pours a glass of champagne to celebrate the end of another book. It is winter in Colorado after a very heavy snowfall, and it would seem that another one is soon to come, when Paul decides to take to the road to return back home after finishing his book. But as the storm rolls in, he loses control of his vehicle, and it falls down into a snowy ditch, causing his car to topple over multiple times. With no one on the roads due to the storm, it would seem that Paul will be left there to die in the frigid, bitter cold. We are then pushed back to a flashback where Paul is speaking with his literary agent and he talks to her about the importance of his leather satchel. It's one of the many superstitions that he has around his writing. It's where he keeps his manuscripts. Apparently he used to keep his first book in it and he remarks about how that was back when he was a real writer. Back before he started making his most popular series, Misery. It would seem that Paul is no longer interested in continuing this series, even though it is certainly his most popular, but because he wants to venture off into different types of writing, he has decided that he's going to kill off the main character named Misery so that the series can end. Back to the present. Okay, shout outs to Alani New. Back to the present where Paul is bleeding out in his upside down car, about to either die from blood loss, a concussion, or the cold. When he is miraculously saved by a mysterious woman who just happened to have a crowbar and no CPR and is strong enough to carry him out of the cold. He awakes later to the sound of her voice saying that she is his number one fan. He opens his eyes to see his savior, a Miss Annie Wilkes. She tells him that he's been in her home for about two days unconscious, but thankfully he's in very capable hands as she is a nurse. She was able to set his dislocated shoulder, prop up his broken arm, and create makeshift stabilizers for both of his broken legs. 
Unfortunately, due to the severe blizzard, the roads leading to and from the hospital are closed. Also, the phone lines are down, so they won't be able to contact anybody until those go back up. Again, this is 1990. I think the book was 1987, so this is definitely pre-most people having cell phones. It makes sense. She comes in to give him pain medication daily and check on the progression of his wounds. At least for now, he seems to be in, in good, albeit a bit strange, hands. <laughs> Capable hands, nonetheless. Meanwhile, his agent calls the local sheriff's department near the small Colorado town where he's known to work. She calls and says that he just finished up a book and usually I would hear from him by now and I haven't heard from him nor has his children. She said she called the cabin that he usually goes to and he had apparently checked out two weeks ago, but no one has seen him since. So the sheriff who ends up playing some form of weak uh, comedic relief, we'll keep an eye out for him. Back with Paul and the mysterious Annie. She is giving him a shave when he mentions that it's sort of a miracle that she found him in that ditch in the middle of a snowstorm. She says, honestly, it's no miracle at all. <laughs> I was following you. <laughs> Again, being that she's his number one fan, she knows that the cabin is where he usually works. Being that the town is quite small, it had gotten around that he'd be in town soon, so she figured that's where he'd be staying. She says these odd things with a bunch of flatteries and pleasantries, so maybe that makes it harder for him to pick up on just how weird this is. Also being that he's in a very vulnerable position, even if he did understand immediately how concerning this is, it's not that he can physically do much about it. But she goes on and on heavily praising him for his brilliance for creating misery. It's her favorite series and she's read every book cover to cover. He asks her if the phones are up and she says no, but it shouldn't take too much longer for them to go back up soon. But if you give me your agent and your daughter's number, I'd be more than happy to keep trying them for you. She then says that she noticed his manuscript in the leather satchel and she asks if she can read it. He says, well, considering you saved my life, the least I can do is let you read my new book. And as you can imagine, she's over the moon about that. She's like, oh my God, I get to read a book that isn't even published yet by Paul Sheldon. It would seem that the new book is going to be the first book that he's written in a very long time that doesn't fall within the Misery series. Misery is a bit of like a period romance. And this is gonna be more about like kids from the slums who have potty mouths and do fun things or whatever. Um, so it's definitely a big tonal shift away from the work that she consumes from him up until this point. And it would seem that Annie's, you know, nice enough, albeit a bit strange. Wholesome in a way that's kind of weird. So being that his new work seems to defect greatly from his most popular work, it makes her feel, you know, notably uncomfortable. She eventually admits that she has a problem with all the swearing and he defends it saying, well, this is a story about kids from a particular slum. I'm from that slum. That's how they talk. And this sends Annie a bit into her first of many tirades. <laughs> Give me a bag of that effing pig feed and 10 pounds that bitchly cow corn. There's one big bastard of a check. Give me some of your oh. Christing money. Look there. See what you made me do. This bitch is crazy. She apologizes saying that sometimes she just gets a bit too worked up. I love you, Paul. Oh, this bitch crazy, crazy. Your mind. So the police, the one guy, uh, starts doing a proper search for Paul Sheldon. Again, they're a bit of a comedic relief that I feel like this movie really didn't need, but whatever. The sheriff ends up reaching this conclusion that a hey, if he crashed his car out here, then he if he didn't die in the crash, he's dead because of the snow, so. And he comes back and seems to have the newest book that is now on the shelves. And little does she know this is the last of the series, i.e. <laughs> where <laughs> Paul is gonna kill off Misery, the main character, and effectively in the series. She claims that the roads leading into the city were open, but the ones leading to and from the hospital are still closed. But she said that while she was in the city, she was able to call his agent and daughter to let them know that he was okay. She also introduces him to her pet pig, Misery, that she named after Misery. She updates him that she is now on page 300 of the new Misery book and it is simply divine, as divine as the Sistine Chapel. And then she snorts out of the room. Later, we learn a bit more about her 
a devotion to the Misery series. Apparently it was her respite when her husband left her. She found herself delving into work and reading a lot to get over the pain. And now she's all but two chapters away from ending this book. Again, that she doesn't know is the last book of the series. So um, I'm sure she's gonna have very strong feelings about that ending <laughs> when she gets to it. In case we needed a bit of a reminder of how helpless Paul is, this conversation happens while he's peeing in a jug um, and Annie takes it as she mentions how being that he is also divorced she understands that it would take Paul a special gal to make him walk down the aisle again not so crazy is so off she goes to read the final chapters of the book and it would seem that this is the quiet before the storm because in comes Annie in the middle of the night very upset calling him a dirty birdie misery Chastain cannot be dead for killing off misery but her spirit is the important thing and misery spirit is still alive I don't want her mad hey yo now she's taking me in firm damn so obviously she's not too happy about the ending <laughs> And um, she gets very upset. She breaks a table. She continues to call him a dirty birdie. You're just another lying old dirty birdie. Which leads me to believe that is her deepest insult that she can give. It must be very high on her hierarchy of insults. And she's irate saying, don't even think about people coming out here to find you because lo and behold, I ain't called nobody, bitch. She didn't say that because dirty birdie. But um, you better hope nothing happens to me because if I die, you die. Now finally resolute that this bitch is crazy, Paul decides to try to get out of the bed on his own with one arm and no legs. That goes as well as you think it would. But he is able to crawl all the way to the door eventually. But little does he know the door locks and unlocks from the outside. So in the morning, she's there. She sees him on the floor because he wasn't able to get back up. But she's there and she's chill suspiciously so well, i guess she's calmed down a bit oh god i'm having a cramp <sighs> i'm good but she helps him back in the bed she says that god has spoken to her and told her that he delivered paul to her so that she can show him the way <laughs> she brings into the bedroom and in an enclosed space mind you a barbecue pit where she commences to cover the manuscript of his new book in lighter fluid and then asks him to light a match to burn it get rid of it this shouldn't be seen by the world he tells her the lighting the book on fire would not solve anything because his publisher already has a copy of it there's already so many people that already have their hands on it you're not saving the world from anything and she says okay then light this on fire they go back and forth he's like it's no big deal she was like okay then light it on fire but the problem is she's his biggest fan so she knows that he's a very superstitious man. And one of his superstitions is to only have one copy of any particular work because he believes it's bad luck to have more than one at a certain stage, I guess. And when he continues to hesitate, she decides to start pouring lighter fluid on his covers, coaxing him to please do the right thing. So what the else is he supposed to do? He lights it on fire. Uh, he throws the match, it goes up in flames, and she seems weirdly surprised that that's how that works. Oh, goodness. Again, I love Kathy Bates so much in this role. I don't think anyone ever could have played it as good as her. Oh my God. But eventually she does give him a wheelchair, perhaps sort of as a reward for taking this step. And she says that today is a very special day as this is the day that he starts writing his new novel where he writes misery back to life. <laughs> Annie is like, it'll be a book in my honor as a thank you for saving your life. While she's talking, he notices a bobby pin on the floor and makes a plan to get it so that he can use it to unlock the door at some point. She brings in a typewriter and he makes a fake excuse about how he shouldn't write on this paper because it'll smudge. And he does a little test uh, typing and shows her that it does indeed smudge. Uh, I'm pretty sure any paper would smudge if you do it right after, <laughs> but okay, whatever. He needed to get her ass out of the house. He flatters her, suggesting that he wants her to be in on every decision that he makes in this 
this new book. However, the ask in and of itself seems to send her into another one of her erratic tirades that makes her get progressively more and more upset. She feels like the ask in and of itself is ungrateful. And she says, you better start showing some appreciation and then bangs on his legs, broken already with the very heavy box of ink. But nonetheless, she does go off into town to get the new paper, thus giving Paul the opportunity to get the fallen bobby pin. It's a bit of a struggle as you'd imagine, but he does eventually succeed. He then uses it to unlock the door. And this is his first time being outside of this room since he's been kidnapped for all intents and purposes. So he's out into the living room and this is where he sees his picture sort of in like a makeshift shrine with him and the misery books and everything. He also finds the pills that she's been giving him up until this point. He then ventures into the kitchen, trying to leave out that way. Again, not without an incredible struggle, but right when he gets to the door, he hears Annie driving back into the farm grounds and he has to rush as much as he can, considering he has no usable feet and one arm to get back into the room to look like he didn't move at all. And this scene is incredibly tense, bitch. I was like, no, bitch, but become a snail, become the war. And eventually he's able to get back in his wheelchair and back into the room as if he didn't leave. However, because that was a lot of work, he's sweating profusely. She's like, why are you sweating? What's what's going on? And he claims that it's because he's an immense amount of pain because he hasn't had his pills yet that she's been giving him for pain management. He seems to have noticed that he can appeal to her kind of warped desire to nurture him, like the way that she's binding his wounds and giving him a uh, medication. And she definitely kind of falls into that. As she's doing that, she's cheerily talking about how on the drive, she had time to think and realized that the reason she didn't have more friends growing up was probably because of her temper. She puts him back in the bed. She gives him pen and paper if he has any ideas to write down uh, for the book that she's making him write. Think of me as your inspiration. Mm -hmm. He then takes the pill that he's been hiding under his tongue and hides it under the mattress. The search for Paul continues now with a helicopter as they find his car crashed into a snowy basin and this is where officially they presume that he's dead because even if he did survive the crash and somehow crawled out because they couldn't find his body inside he undoubtedly probably died in the snow or was eaten by a passing animal or something that dude did but again our sheriff is like, there's crowbar dents in this door. Somebody pulled him out. Though he may be dead, he's not dead the way that y'all said he is. Back with Paul. He's slowly starting to collect more and more of those pain pills and then putting them in a makeshift envelope to try to drug her and make her pass out so he can escape. So as he waits for his opportunity, he does start to write. And apparently what he writes isn't up to standard for Annie. She says it's not worthy of him. She says it treats the audience like they're stupid, like they didn't read the last book. This is when she goes into a very iconic rant about how when she was a kid, she used to go to the theater weekly to see chapter plays. Cliffhangers. I know that, Mr. Man. But she went to see an episode that ended with the hero welded inside of a car that was going off of a cliff. And at the end of the episode, you don't see him leave. He just falls off the cliff in this car. And so she rushed the next week to see what happens afterwards. And they do a replay of the previous week where they just added that he somehow was able to get out of the car. While all the other children laughed and cheered that their hero was still alive, Annie got incredibly upset and stood up in the theater yelling, They just cheated us! He didn't get out of the car! Duty car! I don't want to compare myself to Annie in any way, but that would probably be me as a child. I would have been very frustrated. And Paul, somehow miraculously more disturbed than he's been this entire time, just kind of stares at her with immense confusion. But he continues to write until he has something to give her. And this version, she seems to be more satisfied with. He then asks if maybe they could have dinner together to celebrate Misery's return. And she is absolutely delighted by the thought of that. She gets dressed up. She looks like a prairie wife. This is a true fantasy for her. Having dinner with the man she so deeply admires in a very concerning way. And he proposes a toast of a very large glass of wine. But before they drink, he suggests that they light some candles to, you know, really savor the moment. And so she goes off to get candles and he puts the envelope of pill innards into her wine. And you sit there in the audience and you're like, oh, she's gonna... Oh my God, this is opportunity only for her to accidentally knock over the wine and you just sitting there like. F 
Ooh, look at that face. You know he threw. Now that that plan has been thwarted, he just continues to write because what else is he gonna do? <laughs> and at this point, it would seem that quite a lot of time has passed uh, since he has been in this home. The shallower uh, wounds on his face seem to be healing up. It's starting to rain instead of snow. And one day, Annie comes in saying that she was in love with him. <laughs> Not just as a writer as she was before, but like in love with him as a man. But this makes her dreary and sad because she knows he doesn't love her. Being that she isn't the movie star type, you'll never know the fear of losing someone like you when you're someone like me. It would seem that because the book has almost reached its end, his legs are nearly all better, he will be leaving soon. And the thought of that for Annie just won't do. He appeals to her, lies to her, and says, why would I leave? I like it here. And she's like, I know that ain't true. She then pulls out a gun. <laughs> and she says that sometimes she thinks about using it. And she doesn't really finish that thought. She just leaves saying that she might put some bullets in it. <laughs> she goes out into the rain and Paul hears her drive off, presumably going into town, maybe buying some bullets. And while she's gone, he goes into the kitchen and grabs a knife. And while out of the room, he's able to look around the house a little bit more. He finds her scrapbook. It's full of newspaper clippings of a bunch of things, including the article of Paul's presumed death. And not only that, because she been busy, okay? Both activity-wise and scrapbooking. She's, you know, she likes to archive. She has newspaper clippings of her husband's death in a quote unquote freak accident, articles about a random nursing student dying who fell mysteriously to her death. Mixed in with that are articles of her own accolades, her rising to the head of the ICU at a children's hospital, her working as in the maternity area, not to mention a slew of articles about infant deaths that happened once she became the head of the maternity ward. She was ultimately on trial for that. Uh, presumably she got off because she's here, but you know, bitch been busy. He goes back to his room, testing how he can pull out the knife if need be quickly. Um, he seems to be having much more mobility in his shoulder area. And you know, undoubtedly he's going to need to, obviously again, this bitch been busy. He stays up throughout the night listening for her, trying to be on guard if she tries to open the door, you know. And despite that, he doesn't hear her when she enters the room when he finally falls asleep and injects him with a sedative. The next morning he's still sedated, but aware of himself enough to lie. And he says that he hasn't been out of the room when she says, I noticed that you have. She's also found the knife and the bobby pin that he planned to use. And she says that she realized that he just needs more time to become used to being here. She needs to make sure that he can never run away. She tells him a brief story of the history of hobbling and then puts a wood block between his ankles and gets a sledgehammer and breaks both of his ankles and then says, God, I love you. You don't have to love me, bitch. I'd rather you didn't. Again, Annie goes back into town. The sheriff actually notices Annie. And recognizes her as the woman who was on trial for killing all the babies, right? And he finds an old article about that trial where he notices that one thing that she said on trial matched some clues that he found along the way trying to figure out where Paul Sheldon is. This leads him to paying a visit to Annie. And upon his arrival, Annie sedates Paul again and brings him into the basement. The sheriff asks her if she knows anything about Paul Sheldon. And as if she can't help herself, she lists off a whole litany of random facts about him, where he was born, his parents' name, uh, how he was a mediocre student. And she talks about, even probably against her better judgment, how much she is his biggest fan and how upsetting it was to hear what had happened to him. Eventually she invites the sheriff in, saying that she prayed for the news about him dying to not be true. But she says that God also told her that she needs to be ready to be his replacement, to carry on his stories, now that he is gone. While she's doing this, the sheriff is continuing to look around the home and he nearly leaves the house satisfied that nothing's there when he hears Paul in the basement. He comes back to the home and eventually finds Sheldon. And right when he sees him though, Annie shoots him through the back with a shotgun. With Paul's last hope now dead on the basement stairs, Annie is like, don't be alarmed. We are destined to be together. And our time in this world, is about to come to an end. I have two bullets in this gun, one for you, one for me. So it's pretty obvious that Paul 
is running out of time here. As she's coming down with the gun and the sedative, he says, wait, if you kill me, then misery is still dead. My book is not done. I must finish it. Otherwise she'll be gone when we go. Let's leave something to the world. She wordlessly agrees and he is able to pocket some lighter fluid in the basement um, while she goes to get his wheelchair. So for a while he continues writing and once he's finished, he'll need his, you know, sort of ritualistic things that he uses when he's done with the book. A single cigarette and champagne, Dom Perignon, or as Annie calls it, Dom Perignon. Yep. So she goes out to get those things and prepares the gun, but she forgets to prepare two glasses. So as she goes to get the other one, Paul pours lighter fluid on the manuscript. When she comes back, he says that all the questions that she had about what would happen to Misery are in his hand and she'll never see it and then lights it on fire. Annie in a panic goes to extinguish the fire with her bare hands. Paul hits her over the head with a very heavy looking typewriter. But this bitch head is made of shrapnel. That don't take her out. It only makes her loose for a minute and then she's like, oh, I'm about to go back at it. But she's so angry, this gives her her first proper curse word of the entire movie where she calls him a lying sucker. Circle of the story. Character development. In the tussle, she's able to shoot him in the shoulder, but he's able to overtake her and make her shoot the second and final bullet. They continue to tussle. He thrusts burned pages into her mouth. She knees him in the balls, but eventually she trips and falls head first into the typewriter. But again, you think that bitch dead? No, crazy makes your skull hard as fuck. Eventually able to get her by hitting her in the face with a prized piggy that she has. And I'm like, is she dead yet? I don't know, the bitch keep going like the Energizer Bunny. But this time she's actually dead. The only major issue I've ever had with this film is that she should have been lit on fire. I don't know why we decided not to do that. I think her being on fire would have been way better, but I digress, the bitch did. So it's been months after escaping. He has released a book that seems to be getting great reviews. And he says to his agent in a weird way, it seems like the entire experience with Annie helped him become a better writer. His agent asks, you know, it's been a while. Do you want to write about the experience? And he says, bitch, no. And she's like, well, I thought you were over it. And he says, I'll never really be over it. He still gets like PTSD flashes. And while they're in this restaurant, he hallucinates that the waitress coming towards them is Annie, but she's not Annie. She's a woman who recognizes him though, as the author of Misery. And she calls herself to him, his number one fan. He smiles to her knowingly and simply says, that's very sweet of you. And that is the end of the movie. That's Misery. I love this movie, classic for a reason. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It's such an interesting psychological thriller. So it's, it's a very visceral and erratic look on the obsession that some people have towards uh, celebrities. I could watch it over and over and over again. If you are doing like a horror movie, like a classic horror movie, triple feature, I would say this movie, The Shining, and um, Rosemary's Baby. That's two Stephen Kings, isn't it? Yeah, he did The Shining too. Anyway, that's all for today, folks. If you liked today's video, feel free to like today's video. Follow me on all my social media, Instagram, Twitter, threads now too, all of which are Kenny JD. And I will see you guys next time. Bye.